Ahí. I call to order the October 23rd meeting of the Mission Fulfillment Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to those who are joining us via live stream video and those who are attending here in our boardroom or via Zoom. We'll note that Regent Tad Johnson is joining us via Zoom. I would also like to give a welcome to our student representatives who are here with us today, Hal Johnson from the Morris campus and Tewo Aremu from the Twin Cities campus. Thank you both very much for being here. Let's turn now to our agenda. The first item on our agenda is a briefing on sustainable development goals. And I'd like to welcome Shane Stennis, the system-wide chief sustainability officer, Katie Pelican, associate professor of the Department of Veterinary Population Medicine, to the presenter's table. Provost Croson, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Thank you, Chair Johnson and members of the committee. The Impact 2025 System-Wide Strategic Plan calls for the university to build a fully sustainable future by demonstrating state and worldwide leadership in sustainability and environmental teaching and research. Specifically, the plan sets a goal for the University of Minnesota to be ranked in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings which measures progress toward the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Today, it's our intent for the committee to engage in conversation about the university's participation, including our current rankings and new initiatives. Joining us for this presentation, we have uh, our chief, our sustainable, sorry, our system-wide chief sustainability officer, Shane Stennins, along with uh, Dr. Katie Pelican. In addition to her uh, position in the College of Veterinary Medicine, she's also the director of the Strategic Partnerships and Research Collaboratives, which is known as SPARC. So I'll now turn the remainder of the presentation over to CSO Stennis and Dr. Pelican. Thank you so much, uh, Provost Croson and Chair Johnson and, and Regents. I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you today. For those of you who are not familiar with Sustainable Development Goals, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the work we're doing associated with this framework. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals is a global framework that was adopted by the UN member countries in 2015 mm -hmm. that represent a globally agreed to frame, plan of action for advancing what they call the five Ps. Uh, people, prosperity, planet, peace and partnerships, with the idea it is to create a sustainable, inclusive, and sustained economic growth, shared prosperity, decent work in a clean environment. The sustainable development goals are designed to be integrative. To achieve any one of, the, one of them will require consideration of all of them. So as we aim for climate action, we have to consider poverty. We have to consider uh, clean water. We have to consider sustainable cities. Uh, they also are designed to inform action in every country and at all levels of society, from local communities to national governments and even institutions like ourselves. Because of this integrative and flexible design, the Sustainable Development Goals are being used locally and globally to support impact-driven initiatives and track progress towards shared goals. This is true here in Minnesota as well. Uh, Global Minnesota runs a Sustainable Development Goal Roundtable that has over 400 industry, nonprofit, and government members. And a number of our most prominent industry leaders in the region actually use SDGs as an organizing framework for their environmental, social, and governance, or ESG programs, including Target, Land O'Lakes, General Mills, Cargill, 3M, and Boston Scientific. Here at the university, you can see that there are many explicit alignments and synergies with both our priorities as a university. If we look at Impact 2025, you see a lot of these reflected in our goals, um, but also in our state. Um, a lot of our partners in the state, on the state itself, explicitly lays out a lot of these as goals. Over the past three years, uh, the UMN 
SDG initiative has used the Sustainable Development Goals as a framework to engage and inspire faculty, staff, and students from 63 colleges, office, and centers across all five University of Minnesota campuses. We have fostered large-scale high-impact programs here in Minnesota and beyond and supported collaborative work both in the university and with outside partners tied to the Sustainable Development Goals. Universities are primed to support local and global partners to achieve their priority social and environmental goals as framed by the Sustainable Development Goals. Our role as a source of scientific breakthroughs, innovative solutions, neutral conveners, and next generation educators and economic engines position us well for catalyzing action locally and globally. Here at the university, the SDG initiative has brought an intentional lens to fostering new programs and aligning existing work across all the mission space of the university as represented on this slide, research, education, outreach, and even institutional systems and campus operations, which are often not included as pillars, but we believe they are. Uh, some examples of the work we are doing across the university system includes um, Sorry. We've worked with the research community at the university, including faculty and staff, to both foster and align to sustainable development goal work, but also to bring more visibility to the work that our community is already doing to address our greatest social and environmental challenges. Just some examples on this slide include we've issued um, over $200,000 in research grants, um, both small scale and, and larger scale. Um, to support faculty work in this realm, and all of those require a partnership with a community member and action in the world. Um, we've also used the experts, um, which is the library-run system to look at, to um, basically be able to uh, look up research at the university um, and mapped it to sustainable development goals. So if you go on the library system, you can actually look by sustainable development goal, who's involved in each, any one of these areas. Um, and this, this uh, figure here is for health, so one of our strengths, of course. So over uh, 60,000 publications in health. Um, and then the, the third and here is the, um, the partnership with the GPS Alliance to incorporate sustainable development goals into internationalizing the curriculum and campus program, or ICC program. So using sustainable development goals to work with faculty to actually integrate some of these ideas into curriculum. Um, we've also been supporting students and, uh, and, and enriching the student experience. Um, some examples there including small grants to student groups to work on films, for example, film series or hunger through the mobile market. Um, we've also mapped the course catalog to sustainable development goals. So you can go on our website and actually look up a sustainable development goals and see what courses uh, exist that are related to that. And then we've also created a centralized website that was actually one of the lessons learned from Times Higher Ed, which you'll hear about, is we don't always tell a central story about all the work, good work we're doing. So we created that. And then probably most, maybe most important, certainly important in terms of like uh, the university having impact in the world is building partnerships. Um, and so we have intentionally centered building institutional level partnerships to advance uh, these goals in the state, which of course align very closely to state goals, which is nice. Um, so some examples here are we, the White Earth Tribal College, um, community, Tribal and Community College, um, actually during the pandemic requested our assistance um, in addressing severe food insecurity that that community was facing. Um, in the response, we created a partnership with that, uh, with that academic organization, the Tribal College uh, Extension Office to work together to um, advance food sovereignty goals in the community. Uh, we also have created a partnership with the SDG Data Alliance, which is an organization that includes ESRI, the, the a company, a private company, um, the Kellogg Foundation, the Public Foundation, and the United Nations, who to establish a, a geo design hub, a, a, a spatial hub for data and, and promoting implementation of sustainable development goals. We are the uh, only academic partner in that group, and we're a local, we are focusing on how do we implement locally, so really focused on the state, and how do we help local partners. So what's shown here is the West Central Initiative. We've actually helped them create their own 
uh, geospatial hub to tell their own story about the work that's happening in rural Minnesota in their region. Um, then we've also uh, are working with Hennepin University Partnerships, so working at the county level to support the county and city agencies to create a collaborative understanding of climate resilience um, and establish shared metro-wide uh, metrics and indicators. So this is something that, again, they're asking us to do. We help mobilize the university to support that work. I'll turn it to Shane for talking about the Times Higher Ed. Thanks, Dr. Pelican, and good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about this important topic and to share some of the good work that's going on around the institution. Really appreciate the invitation board members to do this today. Um, in MPAC 2025, the university committed to building a fully sustainable future. And as the provost shared in her introduction, a key to advancing this goal is demonstrating state and worldwide leadership in sustainability and environmental teaching and research. The Times Higher Education Impact Rankings is one of the tools we are using to assess progress and impact on this goal and this specific action. And we have set an objective increasing our ranking year on year as we go through the strategic plan implementation process. Sustainability is an area, as you know, with considerable breadth and complexity. To measure how we are demonstrating leadership at that state and global level, we need tools and metrics that can cover the full scope of the university's mission, encompass a wide span of academic disciplines, and we have to rely on frameworks that are widely understood around the globe and across sectors. The impact rankings meet these requirements. As you heard from Dr. Pelican, the SDGs are a globally recognized framework for sustainability action, which are also used locally by government, industry, and other organizations. The impact rankings are one of the few sustainability measurement systems structured around the SDGs that are also specifically built for higher education. The use of the SDGs as a framing tool ensures that we, they apply to a broad array of disciplines and cover the span of university activity. And they are a metrics framework that is um, widely used by higher education partners and peers around the globe and by a growing number of US institutions, including Penn State, Indiana, and Michigan State and the Big Ten, and other large public institutions in the US like Arizona State. The impact rankings occur once per year like many ranking systems. Data is gathered and submitted in the fall by the institution and rankings are published the following spring, usually in May. To participate in the impact rankings, institutions are required to submit data on four SDGs. Three of the SDGs are chosen by the participating institution from that list of 16 that Dr. Pelican shared earlier. And all institutions are required to submit data on SDG 17, which is partnership for the goals. Institutions are ranked on each SDG relative to other institutions that are submitting data for those SDGs. And an overall ranking is also issued for each institution. If each institution submit data on more than four SDGs, which is certainly possible, only the top three scoring SDGs plus SDG 17 are counted toward that overall ranking. And as you can see in this slide here, the data that is being requested for the SDGs spans kind of three broad categories. First is research, where they're really asking us questions around the quantity of research we do that relates to that SDG and the impact that that research has, or sort of how widely is it utilized, how impactful is it, is, is it in that sector. The second is around institutional change. And here we're talking about things like the percent of graduates that come out of the institution in that particular area. So for something like zero hunger, how many people are we graduating that have degrees relating to agriculture or nutrition or to economic policy around hunger and agricultural systems? Um, it also can relate to campus programs and services and campus policies. And then finally, they're looking at metrics and measures around outreach. How are we impacting the world around or outside of us through our community services that we provide, through the partnerships that we form, and through the educational services we provide to the broader community. For our first submission in the fall of 2021, we assembled a group of stakeholders across the university system and consulted senior leaders to identify which SDGs to submit data on. Through this process, the five criteria listed on this slide were used to select SDGs for submission. 
We sought to align SDGs that enabled us to measure impact relative to the, uh, to the impact 2025 plan, and specifically the minor sections foci in that plan. If you recall, those minor sections foci are one, build a fully sustainable future, of course, but then also driving innovation for next generation health and advancing natural resources and agro food systems. Additionally, we screened the impact rankings to identify places where we could make change um, on the impact 2025 implementation horizon. So looking for those places where we thought there would be an opportunity to positively affect the course of things over the four or five years that impact 2025 would be our strategic plan. And then really looking at areas where we could exercise things within our control and had, of course, the potential to do well based on an internal assessment um, that our library staff had done based on university research. The final kind of component of our criteria and selection process really was focused on our systemness. Um, we are one of the few institutions that participate in the impact rankings that submit data as a system and not as an individual campus. So we were keenly focused on SDGs where we had a broad span of activity across all of our campuses and locations and we had strengths that really brought in the multiple perspectives across the university system. As you'll recall, these are the 17 SDGs um, and the ones that we could select from. And based on the criteria in the prior slide and that process that I articulated, the following SDGs were chosen. First, SDG two, zero hunger. Then SDG three, good health and well-being. SDG 13, climate action. And I've, I mentioned before, all institutions are required to submit data for SDG 17 partnership for the goals. To compile information for the submissions, we created task teams for each SDG. The task teams were composed of, of groups of subject matter experts from across the system with broad knowledge of university programs, initiatives, and activities in that particular SDG. Each team incorporated participants from across the campuses and locations and from a variety of roles, including program staff and administrators, faculty and researchers, and subject librarians. The task teams compiled and prepared information to submit to Times Higher Education and administration of the submission tool and management of the relationship with Times Higher Ed was facilitated by the university's institutional data and research team. As I mentioned before, for each SDG, the impact rankings involve submission of data across the span of the mission. We wanted to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that were getting requested. So this slide shows you the categories of metrics and measures for the zero hunger SDG. Uh, you can see that there are ones related to research, to student hunger, to things that we're doing in terms of uh, public access and education around national hunger, campus food waste, and then of course the proportion of graduates we have in disciplines that relate to this particular topic. The percent on these slides represent the sort of composition of the total score for this SDG that each of these areas uh, represent. So you get a sense about how they're weighting different areas of activity um, and what importance they're assigning to different activities that we undertake. We also wanted to give you a, a sample of some of the kinds of data that we submitted for this. Depending on the measure, the impact rankings may rely on quantitative data or sometimes on the information of the existence of programs or initiatives. The first metric listed here, research site score, is quantitative and measures the proportion of universities' publications in the top 10% of journals according to the site score metric, which is an internationally um, scored metric using published data. Um, and these are the research pertaining to hunger, which could come from a wide array of disciplines, including things like agriculture, malnutrition, policy, law, business, and economics. So it really is drawing upon all the fields and disciplines that might relate to this particular topic. The second metric listed on student and staff hunger interventions requested that we provide evidence of the existence of programs to prevent or alleviate hunger among students and staff at the university. For this, we provided information on two university programs. The first is the program at the University of Minnesota Duluth called Champs Cupboard, and then a program at the Twin Cities campus called Nutritious U Food Pantry. For these types of metrics, we're, asked to, we're, we're scored on um, whether we have a program or initiative in this particular area and whether the information that we provide to them to justify that or to demonstrate that is publicly available. So it can also be subject to scrutiny beyond the Times Higher Education organization. 
For our first submission, um, this data went in in fall of 2021, and we refer to it as the 2022 rankings because we don't get results back until the spring. Um, we scored well for our first go around. We were in the top 25 in the United States, and we had particular strengths show up in Zero Hunger, scoring fifth in the US and 16th in the world on this particular SDG. And SDG three, Good Health and Wellbeing, we were second in the US and tied for 57th in the world. On our climate action um, metric, we, we when you get above a rank of 100, they stop doing individual rankings. Um, so they give you a range of how you place. And for this particular one, we were between 101 and 200 in the world. We redid this entire process last fall and got our, our results back in May of 2023. And as you can see, we improved substantially from the first go around. From 25th in the US to eighth, the second, the second year of our participation, and we saw a marked improvement in various SDGs where we moved up, moving up from fifth in 2022 to third in the US around zero hunger and 16th, from 16th to 14th in the world. And good health and well-being, our US ranking was unchanged. Um, obviously, when we're in the top two, it becomes harder to move up to that top one place. Uh, but we're moved from 57th in the world to 44th. Um, so appreciable change over that time frame. You'll notice that the ranking for climate action did not uh, change. As I stated before, they don't provide detailed rankings above 100, but we did actually get visibility uh, into the score that we had in that particular area, and we did see improvement in our score. So we think that we probably also moved up in ranking on this particular metric as well, and that we'll see more opportunities for growth in that space as we go forward. I'm now gonna pass it back to Dr. Pelican, who will talk about initiatives as we think about going forward and, and how we intend to improve over the coming years. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, so I'm, gonna, I'm here to talk about what, what are the next steps for this? How, where are we going from here, both in terms of the SDG initiative and the Times Higher Ed Impact rankings. Um, first, we're gonna be adding, uh, in terms of Times Higher Ed Impact Rankings, we will be adding uh, SDG 6 this year, which is clean water and sanitation. Um, to, and water is, I mean, I think we all understand the water is important to the, in Minnesota, but uh, it's clearly an important area of work for our university across several of our campuses. I particularly want to point to our central water council and water network in the office of the vice president for research that are coordinating water related work across the deep bench of centers um, and expertise at both our Twin Cities and Duluth campuses and among our other campuses as well. We will be working with the Water Council to advance their efforts to establish a toolkit to support water planning and program implementation statewide. We will also continue our partnership with the Environmental Quality Board that we had been, we've already started over the last couple of years to advance state goals under the state water plan both of which we feel will be uh, nice things to present to Times Higher Education for uh, SDG 6. We will also be leveraging our existing partnerships and programs to expand our portfolio of work that aligns to Impact 2025. This includes expanding and strengthening university partnerships with tribes, nonprofit organizations, and state and local agencies, as well as leveraging our geodesign data hub work under all all the focus SDGs that we've already been working under. We will also explicitly turn our attention to supporting the university to implement priority actions from the new campus climate action plans. In addition to expanding our work on the Impact 2025 Focus Sustainable Development Goals, we have a growing portfolio of tools and applications initiated through the SDG initiative and our partners that we will be further leveraging to help the university and our whole community better support Minnesota and the world to thrive. This includes leveraging the research and course mapping work to strengthen university curricular and research programs, expanding partnerships with local to global stakeholders through the establishment of a SDG DO design innovation hub that's going to leverage the existing work we already have with the SDG Data Alliance, as well as some global leaders that we have here at the university and data related to SDGs like the Pop Minnesota Population Center that will um, and it will expand also the website to better tell the story of the university's impact and, of course, expand our submission under Times Higher Education, as we've talked about. Thank you for the opportunity to present today regarding the SDGs. This is an important framework for our institutional sustainability efforts, 
across the breadth of our mission, or across our operations and our locations to better serve the state of Minnesota and beyond. We welcome your questions and discussion, and we provide the questions on the slide here regarding the future use of the impact rankings and how the SDG initiative can best serve Minnesota to help prompt that conversation. So thank you again. So <clears throat> thank you. Chief Sustainability Officer Stennis and Associate Professor Pelican for that presentation. So colleagues, any questions or comments from the regents? Uh, Regent Turner. Thank you, Chair Johnson. So you've talked about um, that you're doing statewide and local uh, and gathering information and hopefully giving advice. And uh, so a local, a local concern is the Herc incinerator. And I, I believe we send our, all of our trash there. Is there any way that we can be helping them solve that problem to get rid of that incinerator that needs to, needs, needs to shut down? And I know this is, it sounds a little political, but I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing from you guys is you're hearing, you know, we might be able to have some answers to help this situation. At least it should come from us. Yeah, um Regent Turner, um, I, I think on that particular topic, as an example, is, is a good example and illustration of how we're working with um, different communities around the state. So if I recall correctly, and we can get you some information on this, we do have faculty members who are working with Hennepin County on various topics through the Hennepin University Partnership, and I believe that is one of them, um, and providing our research expertise to help them navigate you know, some of the issues that you, you raise in the topic that is really present in our community right now today um, and is an active and ongoing conversation between community members and the county. Yep. And that's what, sorry, that's what I wanted to be assured of, that we're in on it. You know, because left to their own devices, I don't know if they'd be able to figure out how to do it. <laughs> well, it's a good example of, of some of the complex challenges mm -hmm. that communities face. Yeah. And I do think the university can play a role in supporting navigating some of those complexities because there's no simple answer to these things. Um, and and, and it, we don't have the answer either. It's a collaborative effort. Any follow-up? No. Oh, okay. Oh. Richard Davenport. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Thank you for the presentation. I encourage anybody listening, this, the docket material was excellent. Thank you. And I'd say very clickable. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate all those links because it was fascinating to me um, reviewing this um, to go to those sites. I'm especially, I want to echo Regent Turner and the topic of partnerships. I'm especially enthusiastic about that. Give a quick shout out to Esri because they are a good uh, university supporter. Um, could you talk a little bit more, uh, just an example perhaps of K-12 partnership you're involved with? Because I think um, the tentacles of this is so far reaching, especially as we look at the next generation and what we're leaving to them mm -hmm. is important. You know, we, we've done, as you saw, we've worked with the tribal college, we've worked, um, we haven't done so much with K through 12. We've working on our own curriculum, um, but there is ample, ample, ample opportunity to do that. You know, we have many, many, many faculty around the university working on K through 12. I think I, you know, in, in part we're doing this because students want it. Students are the biggest champions we have. And I think K through 12 is, is just as true. For, you know, these are the folks that are going to be solving these problems, right? Are, are faced with dealing with poverty in the future and, and dealing with climate change. So, I, um, it, it's it's not that we don't want to, and I think there's huge opportunities there. Um, so, I, I think we will be. Um, it's really more a matter of bandwidth than anything else, right? Cool. And it, I'm certain there's examples out there, but it's yep. another one of those um, cases where how do we tell our story mm -hmm. and actually find all that because mm -hmm. we are so broadly dispersed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For sure. Yep. Yep. Regent Hipsch. Huh. Thanks, Chair Johnson. Great presentation. This really energizes me. Uh, when I look at 
the list, it's really hard for me to pick out three or four when they all need to be done. <laughs> it's like on average, Bill Gates and I are both billionaires, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so when you're looking at this and you're trying to pull three up and or four up and we have all these, I hope we're moving all of these initiatives forward somehow as a state because every one of them is vital. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, to pick one over another, I just, it's really hard for me. I'm glad you're picking the ones that you have, but I don't think we should be doing stuff just for rankings. Mm -hmm. I think we should do stuff because it's the right thing to do, and we need to move all these initiatives forward. So hopefully in, in the back of our minds, we're starting to work on each initiative, regardless of whether it's used in the ranking or not, and still prioritizing it. Mm -hmm. So thank you. If, if you go to our webpage, you'll see that we have a page for every single SDG. Good. So we are doing work, and that's one thing I really like about it, because we are a huge comprehensive university, and everyone can see themselves in this framework. Everyone is contributing to these goals. So part of it is, is showing them that they're in a community do, sure. that's doing it, not just individual work. Yeah. So, uh, just a quick follow-up. Just like on the... Decent work and economic growth and uh, industry innovation, that kind of goes really hand in hand because uh, in rural Minnesota, I talk about that a lot because that's where I'm from, and uh, we just don't have the employees, so we need to upgrade the jobs, but that's also improving the infrastructure, which could help with the, the whole uh, climate change in action and everything else we're trying to do as well. So um, as we do these upgrades, we want to make sure that our plants and our, everybody is doing everything Ah, uh, great, right. but mm -hmm. it, so, yeah. yeah. Ch Chair Johnson and Regent Hipsch, just to follow up on your question and Dr. Pelican's comments, um, it is, you're sort of hitting the nail right on the head. It is an integrative framework and all these things are interconnected and intertwined. Um, and we do have university activity going on in each SDG. Um, we've only focused on the four for the purposes of the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings Measurement, um, but there is a real rich and robust body of work going on in each of these areas, which I think also uh, ties back, uh, Regent Davenport, to your question about partnerships with K through 12 schools. Um, Dr. Pelican and her colleagues work uh, pretty closely with a number of different partners around the state, many of which whom are sort of by extension working with their local K through 12 schools. And so we're affecting change in that sort of SDG framing and translation to those schools through our work with partnerships like the West Central uh, Initiative, the Regional Development Organization for Western Minnesota. So. Well, and also groups like the Raptor Center and the Bell Museum and, and Cedar Creek yep. Ecosystem mm -hmm. Science Reserve, all of these are groups we work with to, who are supporting K through 12 right. education work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Regent Tao Urabi. Sure, thanks Chair Johnson and speakers. Um, that was a really excellent presentation and I really enjoyed it and just hearing about how we are participating in, um, in kind of placing ourselves uh, in, in that framework and, and things like that. And I agree with Regent Hipsch that um, all of them feel important. And my question is really uh, who, who decides which of these SDGs we should work on. I guess I was curious more about um, how, how that came to be. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think we, we, one of the beauties of it is we don't decide. We're already doing work under all of these SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we did decide to not submit under, you know, submit to Times Higher Ed under all of the SDGs. We tied the ones we submitted to, um, to the Impact 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really, you know, we, we, we wanted to learn about submitting before we jumped into trying to submit across all of the SDGs. And we've learned a lot. And so now we're expanding. We're just being a little conservative in terms of that submission. But as, as we mentioned, we have a page of work that's happening at University of Minnesota under every SDG. Um, I think sometimes we as an academic institution will sp expend a lot of energy choosing when in fact we can be inclusive mm -hmm. of all of our work um, and encourage yeah. all of the work to be applicable to outside and solve problems in the world and support um, support partnerships that advance the impact of the work, right? So that's a lot of our effort. Not so much choosing the work as helping the work be impactful and build the right partnerships and bring in funding that, to make it sustainable and all those things. 
just to follow up, I think that's that's great to hear, and I think that's that's really important because I I understand the importance of rankings, and sometimes we want to put our best foot forward, right, to be able to get there. But I think being able to see the you know, the full picture so that it maybe pushes us to have stretch goals, but also recognizing that we are transitioning as well, right? And so it's not like you're starting with a blank slate and then you're just gonna reach for these goals. Sometimes we have to actually reach and create transition plans for where we are, especially around climate and things mm -hmm. like that. And so I just want to be mindful that, um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to hear about that. And I will take a closer look at kind of that <laughs> page that you're referring. But I, I, I'm uh, glad to hear that that exists and that we are thinking uh, holistically instead of sort of picking which things to put forward. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. And thank you for that perspective and information. Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you both for the presentation, colleagues for the discussion. I'm really glad we're having this. And I feel like it's, it's been a theme lately, you know, between the uh, campus plans and, and the sustainability plans, and, and that's great. And I hope that continues. Um, I agree with a lot of what's been said. And whether before this, after this, whether we do nothing, because of the breadth of our institution, we're touching these. Mm -hmm. Uh, VR faculty that are engaged in all these anyway. And that's great, right? And that's a good place to be starting from, as was just said. Um, but then we, you know, there is a conversation to have about where we want to prioritize or kind of focus in or elevate and whatnot. I think that's some of what's happening. When I think about that, uh, you know, the, I think that should be guided by, I'm thinking of two principles. One is local needs. Um, uh, mentor sections, it was, as was mentioned before, and um, local expertise, right? I mean, where we have all the expertise to some extent, but we do have some critical masses. And I mean, we know what our strengths are, right? And, I, and that, that's really where we start from, I feel like, and saying, okay, we know we're already good at this. We know we have, you know, some of the best experts on these. And where those intersect, that's why the term intersections was coined, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> President Gable, all right, nice, nice one. Um, <laughs> where those exist, I mean, you know, that's, that's what we elevate. So that, that's how I think about that. Um, and it's not that we're leaving the others behind. Um, we're still working on them, but then also, this is where we benefit from this large ecosystem of higher education in this state. Um, in that we can also look at our partners and say, wow, we know Minnesota State is strong in this area and they're already doing great in it. We're not going to abandon that. We're going to partner with them. Mm -hmm. We're going to lead on this one and maybe follow them on that one. But together, along with them, the tribal colleges, the private, we know we're serving the state you know, as needed, obviously with us leading being the R1 um, institution. So that's just how I think about that. And then my other thought is... Um, we, we have to lead by example um, internally. I'm looking at SDG2, Zero Hunger Metrics, and of all the different categories, the majority, if, if you add up the percentage, are the ones related to your own practices, right? Scholarly work, research, um, where your students and, and graduates are working, and that's important, that's 46%. The other 54, student hunger, campus food waste, campus practices, so it's about your own actions, right? Um, so. We really, and again, that's, we've been having those conversations and we'll continue to, but I mean, when we're thinking about this stuff, the first place we look, our policies, our purchasing, our uh, capital requests and, and, and what we're doing and, and how it's fitting in all those. So, thank you. Thank you. Regent Gully. Yeah. <laughs> got distracted for a second. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Speaker, so much. Um, I actually just wanted to make a comment that this presentation was great and um, that I think this is, and especially the intersectionality of it, is the most important work that we can do as a university. Um, it's the legacy that our students will leave. It's the legacy that our faculty will leave, we hope, right? Um, and I just uh, really appreciate the work and thought that goes into it, and I appreciate the um, 
the fact that you are highlighting all of the goals and then focusing on some that were really well um, positioned to move. Um, and also, you know, I, I just, I think that we're doing a great job of this, but I hope we will really continue to invest in talking about how the work that's happening around this, that's really like tied into this, um, is, is the legacy of the university, as I said, but, but what I mean is, is the work that we're doing for the future of our state. Um, I, I have four kids, and um, I see them as sort of proxies, like stand-ins for what the next generation looks like to me. Mm -hmm. And when I think about what, when I even think about these last two years and how we have, how the effects of climate change are ramping up really quickly and we're watching these disasters happen, um, I've seen my family in harm's way um, because of it. And I think this is what I'm leaving my kids. Um, so, so I could probably talk for a long time and I don't need to, but I just want to say thank you. And I just want to say, let's continue to not only lift up this work, but really highlight the ways that it's, that it, that it's helping the future of our state and the future of the, of our, you know, of our kids. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Provost Croson. I, I Thank you, Chair Johnson, members of the committee. I just wanted to reinforce something that Regent Kenyani alluded to and uh, Regent Gully mentioned in terms of intersectionality. I think one of the real innovations of this initiative, but also of the SDGs and of the rankings for the SDGs, is that they do represent both our, you know, our, what I think of as our mission side in terms of research, teaching, outreach, but also our operational side in terms of how we run our campus. And I think this has been this this you know, whole journey on this learning experience for these particular uh, goals and this particular initiative has really been an example of how the academic side and the operational side can collaborate, can work together on a shared goal, can reinforce each other, can uh, can push each other to, to indicate we need to do more in implementing this or here's a thing we need to do some more research about because it's a challenge. So for me, that's been the real uh, strength of this initiative. I'm optimistic that it will not only continue within this initiative, but it will be uh, inspiration for many of our other initiatives is that, mm. that close collaboration and that uh, continual reinforcement. Thank you, and that's an excellent summary. I want to thank you again for an excellent presentation, great discussion. This is really important work. And I guess, so we're measured on three, but working on 16, right? And all good things, so thank you, uh, Chief uh, Sustainability Officer Sedis and Dr. Pelican for your presentations. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have a discussion on potential realignment of two Board of Regents policies, tuition and fees and student service fees. And Provost Croson, would you like to start us out? Thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, our next agenda item is a discussion regarding potential alignment and combination of the two board policies that uh, Chair Johnson recommended. One of the goals of Impact 25 system-wide strategic plan is to develop a leading edge tuition and pricing model. And one potential innovation that's being proposed is a combination of two currently separate policies that would allow the board to engage on the topic of tuition and especially fees in a more holistic way and to better understand their overall impact on student finances. This particular topic has been added to our work plan in advance of the traditional cadence for policy review and revision. Typically, we would put these policies through the comprehensive review process, collect and incorporate the suggested changes, and then bring the revised policy to you for review and then action. Instead, because of the importance of this topic, we are actively engaging with the board in advance of the completion of the comprehensive review to get direction on whether the combination that we're suggesting would be welcome. The presenters will touch on some of the initial revisions that are currently being proposed in that comprehensive review process. Joining us for this presentation and discussion are Dr. Calvin Phillips, Vice President for Student Affairs, and Julie Tomlinson, Vice President and Budget Director. 
With that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn it over to VPs Phillips and Tomlinson. Please. Please. Great. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Uh, to start, it has always been a bit confusing, at least to some of us, as to why there are actually two separate Board of Regents policies in this area. As Provost Croson mentioned, there is a policy on tuition and fees, and then there is a separate policy on the student services fee. There are some important procedural differences for how the student services fee is developed and how the funds are managed, and that is probably why we have two separate policies. But for students, that fee is just one of what could be several that are charged each term along with tuition. Additionally, it is relevant to note that these policies have not been updated in over 10 years, a time period in which the delivery of instruction and student services has definitely changed. Therefore, two primary goals for us in reviewing these policies have been to look for ways to simplify them or to clarify them and to update them. As you will hear today, our initial recommendations will be to combine the two policies into one and shift some of the detailed procedural guidance into an administrative policy for clarity purposes. And then also to recognize that instructional modalities have continued to shift and evolve in ways that have made some of our previous policy language a bit outdated. The existing policy on tuition and fees, so the first one, was most recently updated in 2013. In general, it provides guidance on the setting of tuition rates and allowable fees, laying out the guiding principles and influencing factors. The current process is for the president to include specific recommended rates and fees grounded in the principles and guidelines included in the policy as part of each annual operating budget for Board of Regents review and approval. Each year, the administration includes a detailed tuition rate table and pages of recommended fees as attachments to the annual budget. And those attachments are actually named in the resolution that is ultimately approved by the board. The tuition and fees policy currently incorporates most of the fees, just not the student services fee. So it includes a, descriptions, a description of allowed fees in four general or overarching categories, course fees, academic fees, which includes our campus and collegiate fees, miscellaneous term fees, and distance delivery fees. This last named category of distance delivery fees was actually made obsolete beginning in FY22 with the elimination of all fees in this category by rolling them into tuition. The last update of the policy in 2013 was the result of an extensive internal process to simplify and clarify the other fee categories. So now our early recommendations for this policy in particular include no substantive changes, only updates to terminology, consolidation of bullet points to remove redundant language, and elimination of outdated elements, such as that reference to distance delivery fees. So why no major changes? Our early recommendations recognize that the essence of the policy, the definitions and the guidelines remain valid and relevant, and the process is still good. The Board of Regents will retain its role in reviewing and approving all final tuition rates and fee levels with each annual operating budget. To get to that point in the process, the tuition rates and fees are part of the robust budget development process we do every year. Specifically, the undergraduate tuition rates will continue to be set and charged based on the parameters in the policy, and the specific rates proposed in the budget will continue to be developed, taking into consideration the named factors, including the availability of state funding, the availability of need-based financial aid, the costs faced by the institution, incentives for students related to access, retention, and timely progress toward degree, and market comparisons. Proposed graduate rates and associated waivers and tuition remission practices will continue to take into consideration the need to recruit the best students in a very competitive environment. And for all professional programs, the schools will continue to propose rates based largely on market comparisons, costs, and availability of state appropriation. Those rate proposals and the accompanying tuition revenue changes are discussed as part of the budget compact meetings with each unit and built into the budget balancing plans at that level, which are then in turn built into the summed up budget brought forward by the president for review and approval by the board. 
Similarly, the course and academic and miscellaneous term fees are proposed by the units annually as part of the budget process. The units enter information into our tuition and fees management system. They enter any proposed changes up or down with supporting information explaining projected revenues, the cost to be covered by the fee, the rationale, projected numbers of students impacted, and so on. All the fees are reviewed to ensure they are allowable and meet the criteria outlined in the policy. And then our leadership budget committee includes them in our recommendations to the president. Again, those fees are then included as an attachment to the president's recommended annual operating budget. We are not recommending changes to these procedures or any substantive changes in the policy language at this time. Good morning. Um, as you, as Vice President Thompson just shared, the university assesses a fee for student services on each campus. The assessment of this fee type of fee is consistent with funding practices at many colleges and universities. The fee supports essential elements of our students' university experience that have become expectation of students and families. Student service fees support student centers, recreational centers, health and wellness services, and student activities and organizations, to name a few. Those programs and services foster a sense of community among students, support their health and well-being, and provide assistance when they face challenges. Students are charged the fee each semester and receive access to all programs and services on each campus. Students cannot choose to pay for one or two services based on their interests, usage, or personal viewpoint. Currently, any student registered for six or more in-person credits in a semester or three or more in-person credits in the summer is assessed the student service fee. Students who are in non-degree seeking programs, high school students enrolled in post-secondary enrollment options, region scholars recipients, or students in approved fully online or mid-level career programs are exempt from and are not assessed the fee. Students who are exempt from paying the fee can opt in for access to fund, fee-funded services. Student service fee policy was last reviewed in a minute in 2005. Our initial review uh, of the policy recommend changes to the eligibility criteria for assessment and exceptions of the fee. These recommended changes will be discussed later in our presentation. Each campus follows an annual process to set the amount of the student service fee. The process involves a committee made up of a majority of students who hear requests from student affairs departments and student groups, deliberates, and put forth recommendations to the chancellors on the greater Minnesota campuses and myself. I review all recommendations to submit proposed fees amounts to the president for inclusion in the annual operating budget. Next slide. Today, we're seeking board's input on recommending revisions to the tuition and fee and student service fee policy incorporating elements on the student service fee into tuition and fee policy focus and regent policy at the governance level, and administrative policy to address process and procedure elements of the current student service fee regent policy would maintain control at a more appropriate level. Next slide. As I previously mentioned, we also recommend revising the criteria for assessment of student service fee in its current format, the student service fee policy contains outdated technical language regarding the criteria for charging the fee. Currently, off-campus distance classes are excluded from the credit count for determining who is charged the fee and eligible for services. That interpretation of distance learning no longer reflects the current practice where students may take online classes from a residence hall or other local housing or who may access fee-funded service remotely from further away. With more classes offered online at all of our campus, the distinction of off-campus distance classes in place in previous decades is no longer a valid reflection of student relationship with campus life. To better reflect the change in nature of the course delivery and remote delivery of programs and services that have historically been campus-based, we recommend no longer excluding credit for off-campus distance classes from the credit count used to determine the application of the fee. We would like to retain the current practice for campuses and colleges to request exemptions from paying the fee for annually approved fully online or mid-career professional credit earning programs. 
This exemption recognized the different relationship that a student in one of these programs has with campus life. In general, students in these programs are working professionals who have no need for community and wellness support offered by the programs and funding through the student service fee. We would also like to retain fee exemption for non-degree seeking students, PSEO, and region scholarship students. We would like to add an additional exemption for students studying abroad for a full semester as an acknowledgement of their changed relationship with campus lives for that time period. As mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we are not asking for approval of the proposed policy changes at this time. We are viewing this really as an opportunity to gain input from the board on the front end of our consultation process. The next steps in that process are outlined here. As part of our established practices, we will present our proposed changes to the university governance groups, faculty, staff, and students on each campus, and we will incorporate any feedback from those groups that strengthens the policy moving forward. Because we are proposing to create a new set of administrative policy and procedure documents related to the student services fees with details that are more appropriate at that level rather than at the board policy level, that new set of documents will also go through the established consultation process for administrative policies before review by the President's Policy Committee and final implementation. We anticipate the full process, including returning to the board for review and action on recommended changes to these policies, to be completed by the end of this academic year. With that summary of what we are planning to propose, recognizing that we don't have the full benefit of completed internal consultation yet, it would be helpful to hear any thoughts you might have at this early stage. So for either today or later in the process, just as the previous presentation, we offer some questions as a starting point for that conversation. Uh, do you think that combining the two policies into one will reduce confusion? Uh, given the evolving nature of how the curriculum is delivered, that mix of in-person, hybrid, and online. Uh, does it make sense to reflect that in the student services fee parameters? Do you agree with the nuance of exempting study abroad students from paying student services fees for the term they are abroad as they are effectively enrolled in and attending another institution at that time? And are there other considerations that you would like to put on the table for us to think through? Uh, Madam Chair, that ends our prepared remarks, and we are happy to turn the conversation over to you and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, VP Tonneson and VP Phillips. Uh, Regents, we're open for discussion. Is anybody? Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Thank you for that. I, it makes sense to me to combine these two policies. <laughs> I think it improves uh, the transparency. Um, it just makes a lot of sense. Um, question, and I don't want to throw this off track, um, health insurance, student health insurance, that's <coughs> not part of the fee, uh -huh. but that is, I, it, yes or no, is that part of the <laughs> fee? I guess that's what the yeah. clarification, and then um, I like in particular in here where um, students can opt in if they're going to participate or use facilities or participate in activities such as that. But the health insurance, um, is that also an opt-in for, I'm thinking of those you identify as less than six credits, non-degree seeking, online, are they able to access health insurance through the university? Um, and maybe it's not part of this. <laughs> Regent Davenport, uh, Chair uh, Johnson. Uh, the, yes, uh, first of all, the healthy, uh, the health insurance is separate. Okay. okay? Yeah. But when we usually charge, when we charge the um, student service fee, the students are automatically enrolled in that until they prove that they have insurance. Okay. okay? So if you are not part of this, uh, the student service fee and you're not paying that, you are not enrolled into the health benefit. And that's probably where the question that you brought up earlier about can they opt in? Yes, they can opt in. Thank you. Is that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. Regent Gully. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, speakers. Um, I also agree that simplifying and clarifying this makes a lot of sense. As a you know former student, I can say that sometimes those 
uh, those things that look very similar but show up as different line items can feel a little bit like, uh, what am I, <laughs> what am I being charged for here? Um, uh, I did want to ask, and and um, with the assurance that I think that it's probably the right decision to say that it's okay for students who are studying abroad to not pay the student service fee. I think like on principle that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to ask if you had a sense of um, how that would impact groups that are funded by those student service fees and if there are ways that we might need to consider, I don't know, just how to fund those things appropriately but on principle, I agree with the idea that if you're not a student on campus and you're, especially if you're paying tuition to another institution or that it doesn't make sense for you to have to pay those fees while you're away. Yep. Uh, Matt, yep. Madam Chair, uh, Regent Gully, it's actually a little bit confusion, confusing and the transition will be odd, but it will not actually have a revenue impact. And the reason is if, if all of our recommendations are accepted in the end. And the reason is that Today, they don't pay because okay. of the, the credit that, that uh, Vice President uh, Phillips mentioned, because they're taking all of their credits elsewhere, they don't pay today, but they're not exactly p pulled out in the policy. And so if we move forward with changing that credit um, application, we need to put in the policy that that group would be excluded on purpose, I mean, and consciously exclude them. Does that make sense? Chair speakers, thank you. Yes, it absolutely does. And I I I wanna say I, I appreciate that and I you know, for the sake of clarity, like for goodness sakes, like let's just <laughs> make that part of the yeah. policy. So thank you. Thank you. Regent Mayron? Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of the questions for discussion, my answer to the first three bullets would be yes, yes, yes. So I'm focusing on the fourth bullet. Are there other considerations for either policy we should consider on the assumption they get consolidated into one? And that is, as you looked at our student service fees in terms of purpose and how they're implemented, did you look at other institutions, comparable institutions, to see what they're doing so that we are hopefully incorporating it into any student service fee policy, what would be considered best practices, or at least having examined what others are doing by way of student service fees? Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Mayron, speaking for myself, the answer to that question is no. We have not looked at what other institutions are doing. So that's a good note. Yeah. I don't know if you have. No, I haven't. <laughs> well, I think that would be, as long as we're going to examine this policy and we're looking at hopefully a policy that um, embraces what's going to happen in the future, I think it would be good to look at other uh, comparable institutions of higher learning and seeing what they are doing with their student service fees. Good suggestion, thank you. Any other questions, comments from Regents? I just, oh, okay, Regent Turner. I just wanna, okay, so the second, the off-campus distance, is that, that means that if you did like all online classes, you in the past did not have to pay the student fee and now you're going to, so I know there's some of our campuses that have totally offline whole degrees, but these um, students may never set foot on the campus, but they're gonna now pay student fees? Is that what you're saying? Um, Regent uh, Turner, um, if it's a fully online program, they will not be charged that. Okay. Um, that's part of the criteria that's in there. Um, I do know um, one of the things I, I made a note on is that there may be some things that we may have to look a little bit different in terms of like, for example, Crutchton that has a, a pretty chargeable undergrad. So those things like that, that we probably could take a look at and how we can do an exemption for them as well. 
And I can add, um, Madam Chair and Regent Turner, the policy, and we are aware, has to have an exception process as well, as most of our policies do. And so it may be that there are situations in which they're not a, in a fully online program, but routinely, as at Crookston, take a lot of their courses more than normal online where the campus can request an exemption uh, from the policy going forward. And again, that wouldn't have an, uh, an impact on revenues because they don't pay today. So. Yeah, the reason I bring it up is because I have a nurse on my floor down here in Robbinsdale, Minnesota, who's going to be doing an a online degree yeah. mm -hmm. uh, from Crookston. Yeah. Yeah. But she'll be living <laughs> down here and working down here. Right. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Provost Gross. <laughs> other, <laughs> other duties as a side. <laughs> okay. um, thanks for the presentation and, and discussion. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, the Regent Turner brought up a good question. It was one of my initial thoughts, but, um, you know, glad to hear we're thinking about those exemptions. It's, it's definitely a challenge to try to figure out that sweet spot because you don't want to go a la carte, you know, where, you know, everyone's just picking and choosing. And we had that discussion as a university, I don't know, maybe six years ago when there was some legislative mm -hmm. proposals around that. Yep. Um, and, you know, so we understand what, I mean, you have to aggregate these somehow. Um, I think these are the right exemptions uh, we're talking about and discussing. Uh, going to the questions for discussion, like uh, Chair Mayron, the first three, definitely on the same page. In terms of other considerations, I'm going to throw out a thought that I don't really have anything to point to, but it's been my sense and my observation, this could be wrong, that there are some costs that have shifted to student service fee that maybe once upon a time weren't. Um, and I, I mean, again, I guess maybe the question there is how do we define um, a student's guy, because you could argue everything is serving students um, at the institution, but just like how we think about what falls in that category um, and what's not going to be fee supported. Um, I will note, I mean, the, the student service fee process, it varies by campus, but by, I don't know if it's board or administrative policy, the majority of the committee has to be students, all right? I mean, so it's a very good, robust, um, transparent process. But I think um, just looking at what's in there now that wasn't before, and then how are we defining what's going to qualify as a student service fee? Yeah. Uh, not, I mean, maybe if she wants to comment, but not a question for now. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Johnson. And Regent Kenyanya actually, I think, just covered what I was going <laughs> to ask about, um, which was about kind of how we, as we're taking a, comp uh, a comprehensive look at this policy, what is defined as a student service fee. And so I guess I'll just say that I, um, in terms of the questions for discussion as well, I think this also makes sense in terms of consolidating these policies, making it easier for people within the institution, particularly students, to understand. Um, uh, I spent two cycles on the student services fee committee uh, myself, and it was um, very, it was actually, I think, one of the most foundational experiences I've had here um, in our governance structure, hearing from Ton, I know a lot of specific details about a lot of different student groups <laughs> from that day uh, still, but it was fascinating. I thought it was a good process um, that was very student driven. Um, and uh, I still think about it all the time to this day. So I appreciate that we're looking uh, at this process uh, and uh, would just add, uh, I thought Regent Mayeron made a very good point about taking the opportunity to look um, at what our other peer institutions are doing um, in this regard. But thank you for your presentation. Regent Gully. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, speakers. And I really just want to say, uh, echo what I've heard from my colleagues, um, Regent Davenport, Regent Kenyanya, and Regent Farnsworth, um, that I think this is a really good process, and I'm glad that we're engaging in it and would be interested in any kind of um, conversation or you know recommendations about um, just how we can continue simplifying this, and, and perhaps if there are things that ha that were once intuition that have been moved to student services, are there places where it would be good to sort of um, rethink that? Because I think 
Uh, I think it's a, this is a really important process because it does involve students so much. And um, because I know that it creates additional space for um, student organizations and things to get funded. So I don't want to um, get rid of it or go the a la carte way. But if there are things that should be reincorporated into tuition rather than student services, um, that can provide sort of a different, I don't know, you know, in that way, I think sometimes we're able to help students like better through tuition to fund their education than through fees, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be worth looking at it to see if there are ways that we can or should move some of those back into tuition. So thank you. Thank you, Tara. Regent Turner. Yeah, I have a question. So back in 1978, I think student fees were like $55 or something like that. You know, <laughs> um, when I was seen, I've, I've been around and, and visited a few dorms, you know, just going to the various campuses. And is it accurate that any um, upgrades or remodeling of the dorms comes out of the student fee pot of money? No? Is that a heaper? So it doesn't. Housing. I was just wondering if that's why Mm -hmm. Student fees have gone up over the years because they have to do their own paint jobs and <laughs> carpet <laughs> repair and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Turner, no. The answer is no to that. The housing rates have gone up to pay debt service on uh, housing improvements, but not the student services fee. That is not part of what they pay for. Okay, so that repair comes out of the... You have got, you're paying for your credits and you're paying for your housing it comes out of there and then if, the student. Fees. If you live in university housing, yes. Okay. Uh, I will say though that the on the Twin Cities campus, for example, the student service fee has included a, a payment for debt service on the student union where the student, because the student union gets funding from the student services fee, but not on university housing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did you wish to respond to Regent Gully? Uh, yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make one comment. Um, over the years, I've been in lots of conversations around what you have um, suggested here. To know, so I just wanted you to know that we have, and it's perfectly appropriate, and we should continue to think about what's a fee versus what's intuition. And we have had a lot of conversations around that. And there are, <clears> as you are aware, advantages and disadvantages on both sides. And we, even from students, um, often students are of two minds on that, as, just as we are. Uh, how, do you, how do you make that distinction? I also just wanted to um, say that I'm not aware, at least I can't think any, of anything today where we've actually consciously recommended moving something from tuition to the student services fee. Um, we have done the opposite, but I don't, I can't think of a case in which we have. It's just that there have been additional services or the growth in the, or change in the services being provided. And obviously the cost increases um, associated with those services. That's what has driven that increase in the fee rather than shifting from tuition. So I just wanted to make that clear unless I'm forgetting something that someone um, has on their list. <laughs> so I just wanted to add that. Thank yeah. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think it's clear there's a lot of interest in and uh, support for the review of this realignment. We really appreciate the opportunity to hear about that at this stage. Are there any final questions? Again, then I'd like to thank Vice President Tonneson, Vice President Phillips for your presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will now resume a new uh, item here. So we continue with our third item, which is a review of the proposed changes to the Board of Regents policies, equity, diversity, equal opportunity, and affirmative action. And I'd like to welcome Associate Vice President Marasam to the presenter's table. Provost Croson, we'd like to get us started again. Thank you, Chair Johnson, members of the committee. This is a policy-heavy mission fulfillment committee. I apologize. <laughs> Today we ask for your review of uh, proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, equity, diversity, equal opportunity, and affirmative action with a vote planned at our next meeting as is our normal practice. Last month, this committee reviewed some of the implications from the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision. This policy review is partly driven by those decisions while also updating other sections of the policy. To present an overview of the review and the proposed revisions, I'd like to welcome Tina Marsam, Associate Vice President from the Office for Equity and Diversity. 
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you, Provost Cross and Chair Johnson. <clears throat> I will jump right into our proposed updates to the policy. Uh, as mentioned by Provost Croson, the uh, first proposed updates relate to affirmative action. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court recently barred the use of race-conscious decision-making in college admissions. Um, it's interesting the court's majority opinion doesn't actually use the phrase affirmative action. However, that phrase is commonly understood to refer to race-conscious decision-making in admissions, among other things. So given the court's express prohibition on this kind of decision-making, uh, we propose that the university express our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in the policy by using different language. Um, specifically, we propose changing the title of the policy to equity, diversity, inclusion, and equal opportunity. Um, this would mean removing the phrase affirmative action from the title and instead inserting the term inclusion. Uh, inclusion is a key component of our efforts to create a campus community where all members are respected and have a sense of belonging, and we feel that that's an important concept um, to include in the policy title. Apart from the policy title, uh, we also propose removing the phrase affirmative action from where it currently exists in the policy's text. Um, I'll point out the two key sections where we propose removing reference to affirmative action. Um, first, the text currently says that the university will develop affirmative action admissions programs where appropriate. And then second, in another section of the policy, the text currently says that the university will practice affirmative action consistent with law in recruiting and search processes. Um, and here the policy is referring to employment processes. Uh, we propose removing both of these sections um, and instead incorporating our commitment to enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the admissions and hiring realms into a pre-existing policy section. So you can see this pre-existing section in the bottom paragraph on the screen, um, and we propose adding the bolded phrase so that the section will explicitly state that the university will promote and support equity, diversity, inclusion, and equal opportunity through its hiring and admissions processes. Uh, moving on, we propose a few changes to the policy content um, to more accurately reflect current university frameworks and practices. Uh, first, we propose adding one new statement to the guiding principles section. It reads, equity, diversity, inclusion, and equal opportunity are fundamental to the university's mission, and the university's faculty, staff, and students share responsibility for the collective achievement of these goals. Second, we add a statement that the university strives to foster an environment that promotes a sense of belonging. Um, during our consultations on the policy with Senate government, govern, government, governance, excuse me, uh, we receive feedback that it's really important to acknowledge this concept of promoting belonging in the policy. A third, we propose adding sex as a protected characteristic in the policy. Um, we know the university must prohibit discrimination based on sex. This is required by numerous federal and state laws. Um, our policy currently states that we prohibit discrimination based on gender, gender identity, and gender expression, but we don't list sex explicitly as a protected characteristic. I'm not sure exactly why it's not listed. I think um, it may have been that at the time the policy was last reviewed, gender and sex were seen as more interchangeable. Um, but I do think it's important that we explicitly ex include sex in our list of protected characteristics. This is the term used in federal and state law, and it has a very particular meaning that I don't think is fully covered by our, our current terms. Um, and I will say and clarify, though, even though sex is not explicitly listed now, the university currently responds to sex discrimination complaints in accordance with our anti-discrimination policies and the laws that apply. Um, and then finally, we suggest updates on the section on monitoring in the policy to better align it with current university practices. So this section currently states uh, the university will assess and reward the performance of individuals and units using the university's critical measures for the equity and diversity performance goals as part of the university's planning and budget process. Um, that's not our current practice at all levels of our planning and budget processes at this time. Um, so we recommend removing that statement um, so that the monitoring section would state, I think more simply and clearly, 
that the president or delegate shall set performance goals consistent with this policy and law and remedy any discriminatory practice that deviates from the policy. So those are the key proposed changes I wanted to share with you today. Um, I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you. Regent Hipsch. Uh, th uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm all in favor of the policy changes. I'm just wondering why it's equity, diversion, diversity, inclusion, not diversity, equity, inclusion, like everybody else is saying, DEI. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so now we're gonna, you have to remember an acronym, so what's your IDE policy? Well, everybody else is DEI, you know what I mean? So should we get on the same page with everybody else on that and change? Uh, I, it is not important to me, but I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts about <laughs> that. Cool. that so. yeah, alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Regent Hipsch, um, Chair Johnson. Um, I, I think either way would work just the same in terms of substance. Um, I think we just slipped the term inclusion where affirmative action had been and didn't you know, think about the order of the wording, but we'd be happy to switch those around because DEI is, is the common, you know, you're right, that is the, the common order of the phrasing. Thank you. Richard Gully. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for being here and for the great presentation. Um, uh, I want to say that this is incredibly important and um, just express my support for it and um, and that we are in a, in a moment where we're sort of trying to figure out how, you know, we live in a state where we have incredible disparity in education and, and opportunities and um, and we are part of the, when we have to be necessarily part of the solution, right? Otherwise, we're getting in our own way as much as anything else. Um, um, so I want to say yes to all of this. Yes, um, I know we're not voting on it, but yes, and um, just put out sort of a, a, a call to my colleagues and to the university that I would also like us to consider um, a real evaluation, and maybe this exists. So um, I'm, I'm still getting my head around everything that we that we have already. But I would love for us to evaluate programs that really support these um, key parts of our mission, and look at ways that we might be able to increase funding. I'm constantly hearing about the precarious funding for things like Chicano Studies, which is where we get a lot. Which is one of many places where we get. A, a lot of students who um, otherwise might not find their place in the university, right? Um, so, you know, and that's like one of many, but it's one that I hear about a lot, that they're, that they're constantly feeling like they might just not exist in a couple of years. Um, and we've had other instances of this where, where programs that have supported um, students who um, maybe didn't have the grades or the SAT scores or the support to get into the university um, where those programs have been eliminated. And we've made those choices as a board sometimes, and sometimes they're made by at the department level. Um, but I would really love for us to recommit ourselves to looking at those programs that, um, that, that help us to be a good partner to the state and to our students in, in lifting diversity, equity, inclusion, and see if we can think about how to better support them um, and I'll get off my soapbox pretty fast, but I also want to say that I would love for us to, um, another thing that I hear sometimes, especially from faculty of color, um, faculty or especially faculty of color and faculty who are immigrants and especially in rural places, but I think this is probably also true in the Twin Cities, is that um, they do a lot of, you know, an exceptional amount of service to the university in terms of supporting students. Um, uh, in different ways than sort of, you know, white, cis, hetero faculty, because a lot of the time students who need extra support, who maybe didn't get that when they were in high school or are coming into the university, so students of color, immigrants, refugees, um, go to them. Um, I would love for us to consider, and, and I know this is not just in our purview, this is kind of across the university, but how we consider those things in tenure and promotion because they really do matter and they can be an exceptional amount of work for our faculty of color, our faculty who are immigrants, our faculty who are refugees who are supporting students in different ways. So thank you and thank you, Chair. Yeah. Can you, can you, thank you. Uh, Regent Tower, Robbie. Thank you, um, Chair Johnson. I'm gonna uh, 
not point both mics at you. <laughs> I just realized she said the mic all this time, so no. I, I, I hope you were heard. Um, I I thank you, AVP, for <laughs> the presentation. I had a question. I don't see access on there, and I'm curious if um, if there's another policy that includes access somewhere else, um, especially for disability or um, mm -hmm. I'm so it's a question. <laughs> yep. Good point. Ah, thank you so much, uh, Regent Tower Rabe, Chair Johnson. Um, that is uh, accessibility um, for all of our community members is really a top priority, um, mm -hmm. especially in the Office for Equity and Diversity, mm -hmm. where I work, um, where we have our system wide disability resource center. Um, we do have a couple of policies that are specifically on that point. One okay. of them is a board policy um, called disability resources. Okay. Um, but I also agree that it is important to spell it to include that concept of access in this policy. Um, it appears a few places in this policy. Um, in section 1C, um, we talk about how equal educational access is critical. Mm -hmm. um, and under implementation in A, we talk about providing equal access and opportunity. So it shows up in this policy mm -hmm. um, and is reiterated in the disability resources policy. But if you know, we're certainly open to making it more explicit here, if that would be helpful. I, I, yes. sorry, just to follow up, I would like to see that, so. Just Thank you. I that. appreciate, really appreciate the support mm -hmm. um, from you and also from Regent Gully for the, for this work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Regent Turner. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I am absolutely delighted that in the Supreme Court's quest to get rid of the words affirmative action, that we're actually replacing it with a much better description of it. Ha ha, Supreme Court. <laughs> um, I, I think that the words that we're going to use can um, bring about, you know, words, you, you have the words first and you make the policies and the actions come afterwards. So the words matter. And I, I think by using, uh, how are we going to do it? Diversity, equity, and inclusion, because alphabetically, Doug, it goes that way? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, but using those words and spelling it out means that we can, we can um, do a better job at making sure we are doing, you know, making everyone feel included. And so I'm just delighted that, and I just hope it takes many, many decades before the Supreme Court figures out that we pulled one over on them. Well, you just told them. <laughs> uh, I thought you heard it here. <laughs> okay. uh, Regent Kenyon. I'm sure they watch region meetings in their yeah. free time. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, AVP Marison. Uh, my question is about <laughs> implementation, uh, Section B under implementation, and specifically uh, search process was also stricken out. So I understand the context and the pretext of the first part of that um, sentence being eliminated, because we're talking about um, uh, recruit well. Actually, I guess, let me rephrase my question. Um, that, that seems to be talking about staff and faculty, and I'm just curious um, how we landed with that change when the, um, you know, the pretext was about admissions, and I'm not gonna ask you for a legal opinion, um, so just, you know, based on what you do know, if you could just give me more insight on that. Yeah, absolutely. Just, Thank you, Vice Chair Kenyanya, uh, Chair Johnson. Um, the we the the status of our equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts in terms of staff hiring, search processes, and retention have not changed um, since the Supreme Court opinion. Um, you know, we have before and now we're not permitted to um, consider protected categories such as race or gender in our hiring decisions, but we are permitted and encouraged and I think we take great advantage at the university of the opportunities to target our recruiting to make sure that we have diverse pools um, to look at recruiting pools before the hiring or before the search committee looks at them to make sure we've done a good job of, rec of recruiting a diverse pool before any decision making happens. Um, and then a lot of efforts to promote retention, right, and in the kinds of programs that Regent Gully was, was talking about to ensure that once we get folks here that they, they feel a sense of belonging and want to stay. Madam Chair. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. Um, I guess 
w I guess, is that with the elimination of, of that line, is that reflected elsewhere that I'm missing it? Um, and again, I mean, this is for review, so I don't have like a proposal or anything, but if, if that's removed there, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see that um, part of it still reflected. Maybe I'm just missing that. Um, cause to your point, I mean, nothing's changed on the hiring side. So. Thank you. Oh, uh, you look like she has a response. Oh, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Kenyanya. Um, we, on the employment side, we stopped you. We took out the term affirmative action for the same reasons, just because when folks look at that now, it's seen as something that's prohibited. Um, instead, we made clear in um, Section C that we will be promoting equity, diversity, inclusion, and equal opportunity through our hiring processes. We don't specifically say recruiting and search. Instead, we just say hiring. But if it is more helpful, we can spell out the term recruiting, recruiting search, and other hiring processes. I think that that might then we can kind of retain that more specific language. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I, I see it in C. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other follow-up? Any other? Well, thank you. Um, I think uh, this has been a great discussion. I appreciate the uh, presentation. I think as we discussed in September, we, as a university, are compliant with law, but absolutely committed to going forward with EDI and equal opportunity and uh, this is part of that. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Our next item is review and action on a proposed change to the Board of Regents policy, student education records. I'd like to welcome Senior Associate General Counsel Ryan Galea and Associate Vice Provost Tidball to the presenter's table. And again, uh, Provost Croson, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Johnson. This is the third policy presentation for this meeting. Yeah. Uh, today, we're going to deviate slightly from our normal protocol on this important item and engage in both review and action on the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy student education records. Uh, this review has been expedited in response to a newly enacted state statute that requires public higher education institutions to share certain data with Minnesota County auditors <coughs> in order to facilitate student voter registration. To present an overview of the new law and the proposed policy revisions, I'd like to welcome Senior Associate Counsel uh, Carrie Ryan Gallia and Associate Vice Provost and University Registrar Stacey, Stacey Tidball. Thank you, Provost Croson, Chair Johnson, and members of the committee. We thank you for the opportunity to share with you today a narrow proposed amendment to Board of Regents policy student education records. My colleague Stacy Tidball will share with you some background on this policy, and then I will describe the proposed change and the purpose for it. Stacy. The board adopted its student education records policy in 1991, and it was last amended in June of 2021. The policy sets forth the university's implementation of the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known more commonly as FERPA. This includes what student information can be released to the public as directory information, and what student information can be more narrowly shared as limited directory information. The limited directory information category includes students' physical addresses, their university email address, telephone numbers, and university ID photos. And it can be shared without a student's written consent only with student groups and university officials. As Provost Croson mentioned, we're here today because of a new law passed in the most recent legislative session. This new law, among other things, includes provisions to facilitate student voter registration. It requires that colleges and universities share student address information with county auditors prior to elections to the extent permitted by FERPA. This sharing will facilitate same-day voter registration for students. Currently, as Stacy explained, the student address information is limited directory information that can only be shared with student groups and university officials. We propose adding a third category to the list of permissible recipients of limited directory information, county auditors for voter registration purposes in accordance with Minnesota State Statute Section 135A.17, Subdivision 2. 
We have intentionally drafted this provision narrowly to limit the disclosure of student data out of respect for student privacy. We have broadly consulted this proposed change with the Student Senate and with campus student governance associations, as well as with student affair leaders system-wide and the Office of the Registrar on each campus. This consultation has been universally positive and supportive of this change. The university supports efforts to facilitate voter registration. Implementing this change at today's meeting will enable the sharing of the address information in advance of November's election. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. For, <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. And before I ask any questions or comments on this, I want to remind the committee that with the changes we made in the structure last month in the September meeting, Mission Fulfillment Committee now has the authority to act on behalf of the board. And all the votes that we take today will be to approve the items directly without additional action being taken by the board tomorrow. And so at this point, before we turn to the discussion, is there a motion to adopt on behalf of the board a proposed amendments to the Board of Regents Policy Student Education Records? So moved. Thank you. Second. Is there a second? Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, discussion? Uh, I guess Regent Verhalen and then. Thank Please. you. Yep. Uh, Chair Johnson, and thank you so much for the presentation. I have just a couple questions to get to the crux of my question, if I may. So just so I'm clear, limited directory information is their physical address, their email address, their phone number, and university ID, correct? Correct. OK. And under the access to limited directory information, that limited directory information will now be made available to the county auditors for voter registration purposes. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct, but I would add that they are not interested in receiving that full data set. They're interested in a subset of limited directory information in order to facilitate the voter registration process. And that was really what I wanted to get at. So the statute, as revised, says that it needs, the list shall include each student's current address but nothing about email address, nothing about photo, nothing about phone number. And so I, I wonder if this revision is too simple in that instead it should provide that and county auditors for photo registration purposes, I realize it says in accordance with state statutes, but something that says for the avoidance of doubt, this shall only include student name and mail physical address. And so that's just a question as to whether that's something that's been discussed. That would make it very clear. It would also make it very clear in messaging to students that it will only be their name and physical address unless they've requested that to be suppressed. Any follow-up comment? Or? Absolutely, Chair Johnson, Regent for Halen. I'm sorry, I was jotting down your proposed so provision to make sure I captured it. Um, uh, we could absolutely make that more clear, not just rely on people. I know I'm a lawyer. I always do cross-reference the statute, and I don't expect every student to pull out the statute and see exactly what's contemplated. So if that would be clear, we could absolutely pull that language into that new provision and clarify that the subset of limited directory information is the only thing that would be made available to county auditors. And your point about suppression, I think, is an important one as well. Any student who has suppressed their information, um, their information would not be shared. And if this um, proposed amendment is um, approved by the board, students will be given an opportunity, again, to opt, into, to opt out of the disclosure or to suppress their data if they individually do not want it shared with county auditors. So we would right. give at least 48 hours to all students to take that action before we would share any lists with the election officials. And I really appreciate that clarification. I'm not quite sure I'm ready to move to make that revision. I mean, I know we're working in a bifurcated or a, a compressed process right now for the purposes of making sure we satisfy the statute and the timeline and the upcoming November mm -hmm. timeframe. But it was something that jumped out to me for the same reason of, yes, I will go cross-reference the statute, but not everyone will. And it, as definitions that live solely within the policy, it could be interpreted by someone who didn't go and cross-reference the statute as more broadly than that. And so I just raise that for our discussion purposes before we act on this. Just on this point. 
Um, oh, I was. Okay. Right. Thank you. I was just going to say that it also adds that if the statute changes, we need to come back here and and revise it rather than if it's referring to the statute, the statute could change and you know mm -hmm. then we don't have to come back here and affirm that. Thank you. Yeah. And Regent Gully. Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for being here. Um, and I actually support that, but on the on the contrary, I wonder if there's a way that because this the idea is for us to help facilitate voter registration, which we know is incredibly important to our democracy. And mm -hmm. students who vote when they're 18 and 19 are so much more likely to vote when they're 30 and 40 and 50 than students who don't. So I feel like this is really important. And I wonder if there might be a way for sure, great, let people opt out if they want. I think that's um, that's within the statute. But I also like on principle support that. What if we let people opt in to also sharing their email and or phone um, with the idea that then if there's an opportunity for a county auditor to say, for example, email people and let them know about voting instructions or something like that. I mean, I think this is such a limited amount of data sharing um, with a very specific purpose and a very specific um, set of individuals right. that for me, I would love to give students the option to opt in for the sake of sharing voter information, because a lot of 18-year-olds don't know. Yep, sure. yeah. Chair Johnson, uh, Regent Gully, and members of the committee, uh, a, a couple of, of thoughts there, and I really appreciate uh, what you're saying, and I think we have shared support of encouraging voting and voter and making voter registration as, as possible for students as we can. Uh, some of this gets relatively into the weeds, as I sometimes say. So, you know, these, these files are large data sends to the county auditors, particularly for a campus the size of our Twin Cities campus. And some of this will simply be set by, by how those files transfer, whether or not they're even willing to accept the phone numbers or emails. But I would say that uh, the the suppression uh, is not so granular that, you know, in our systems today that students can select only share my address. Like the contact information for a student moves as a whole. So once we have their permission to share their contact information, we have it. Um, and once we have their, their suppression, we can't share any of their contact information. The way students get more granular control of that, and I wouldn't advise this, is by what information they give us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also wanted to add, I, I'm, we're here today to highlight one part of this voter facilitation legislation, but there are a lot of other provisions that go to exactly your point, Regent Kelly, about educating students about voting resources. Every campus now has to have a campus voter registration lead, someone who is designated on each campus to take that role. And then we are obligated to send several communications directly to students um, at sequence times prior to any election, sharing clear information about voter registration, linking them to voter registration forms if they want to <laughs> register in advance of the election, directing them to nearby polling places. So the sort of legislature sort of trusts us to do that work. And it's been interesting in consulting this. There's really great enthusiasm on all of our campuses. Um, people are lining up to take that camper voter, voter registration role. And um, particularly our Duluth students are looking forward to a contested mayoral election this year. So we feel it's really important to be able to get that information to the um, county auditors so that we can make sure as many students are able to participate in that process this fall. Thank you. Okay. I have perhaps one Thanks. small thing to add to, which I think is a combination of the questions you asked and also those of, of Vice Chair Kenyanya. Uh, you know, I think what we say in the policy is obviously of critical importance, and that is the place to be our, our most accurate in our, and perhaps most legalistic in our phrasing. This is not, however, the primary vehicle that we use to communicate to students about their options. So, you know, to the extent that we can clarify in our communications about what will actually be shared in terms of the st specific data points, um, we need to build that into, you know, whether it's email or my U notifications or newsletter articles to inform students about what's being shared. That's probably more likely to reach our, our quote, average student than the specific words in the policy, which again, obviously need to be accurate and carefully phrased. Thank you. Okay. 
Bridget Farnsworth. Thank you, uh, Chair Johnson, and I appreciate this conversation. You know, I work in student civic engagement, and so I'm very interested in this uh, discussion and support what we're doing. I'm intrigued by what Regent for Halen is proposing. Um, I'm still recovering from some procedural gymnastics and audit this morning, <laughs> um, and so I'm <laughs> I'm not going to lead on any of that. But um, I'm am interested to hear what you think after this discussion because I support um, what you're saying around. Um, making the, you know, those changes to make the policy a little bit more clear, particularly with the specific pieces of student data, I think that would be helpful right. to students. I hear the point about the, the communication, so there's, there's a whole separate part about the mm -hmm. communication strategy, right? But I remember I'm um, dealing with this policy before I'm on the board. I think we made some other edits to it when we were recently after joining the board. Um, and so I remember that our discussion about this policy, the broader student educational records policy then. Um, and so I'm, I'm supportive of what you're saying, but I'm, I'm intrigued to hear what your what your reaction is to this and if you're you're still there, if you're um, thinking something else. So thank you. Any We're going to take a vote. Procedural. Uh, I, I guess that we need to take a vote on moving forward with us. Um, so, or, go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, Regent Verhalen, would you like to move for the amendment today? I would. Um, hearing this discussion, I, I would like to move for an amendment um, to add after the red line that states sub, subdiv two add the language which shall be limited to a student's name and physical address comma and then the rest of the sentence as written so again that portion would read and county auditors for voter registration purposes in accordance with minnesota state statutes section 135a 17 subdiv 2 which shall be limited to a student's name and physical address, comma, unless the student has suppressed a prohibited disclosure of their information. Second. Okay, second. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to recess now or make a motion? You want to recess the committee? Okay, okay at this time, we're going to recess the committee. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Okay. Um, what do we want to do? Um, I'll move to recess the committee so we can get some mm. procedural language yep. in place mm -hmm. and then we can come back for the motion and a vote for, for the vote. In time frame? Um, five minute recess. Perfect. Okay. I'm going to draft the language so we can use it. And so we can all that. look at it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I call to order once again the Mission Fulfillment Committee. We have had distributed at this time a proposed amendment, and I would ask Regent Verhalen to uh, discuss this with us, please. Yes, so in front of you is a printout of the docket materials, the language that uh, I moved is highlighted in yellow for clarity. Um, and at the advice of council, which was very much appreciated, a small revision has been made, so I'd like to revise my motion uh, to add which information, which is the new addition, which information shall be limited to the student's name and physical address. Mm -hmm. Second. Uh, Regent Farsworth? Oh, I'll just second. I'm just seconding. Oh, okay. if, if it needs to be. Yeah. Do we need a motion? All in favor? All in favor? The amendment? Aye. Should Aye. we discuss? Aye. Okay. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to vote on the policy. <laughs> <laughs> um, are, is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we come to the consent report, and uh, Provost Rachel Corson will present that to us at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I'm pleased to present the consent report for your consideration, which includes two new academic programs and the conferral of tenure for four new faculty positions. Uh, these conferrals include two of the university's newest deans. Dr. Prasad Bordkar of the, as the Dean of the College of Design, and Dr. Sarah DeWalt as the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences. The consent report is presented with my and the President's recommendation for approval, and I'm pleased to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Is there a motion to recommend approval of the consent report? So moved. Second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion is approved. Finally, um, this brings us to information items. Again, Provost Croson, anything to highlight at this time? Thank you, Chair Johnson. I'm pleased to remind you that our regular report of select student, faculty, and staff accomplishments has been included in the docket for today's meeting, along with links you can follow to learn more about them. We, I had six that I had identified to highlight, but I'm going to skip those given our time constraints and just urge you to, uh, to take a look at the docket. There are some phenomenal faculty, staff, and students doing phenomenal work, and we're all very proud of them. <laughs> Thank you, Provost Croson, and with that, I'll adjourn the meeting. Okay.